to the Gettysburg National Military Park in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. That's Mr. Graham. Hi there. That's Mr. Gimby. That's Mr. Ray. And this is Abraham and Lincoln. That's right. And today we are going to take you on a virtual field trip of the Gettysburg National Military Park. We're going to show you some of our favorite sites, not just monuments, but other very interesting aspects of the park, both from a history standpoint and Mr. Graham from a... Hopefully a little bit of a science standpoint as well. That's right. So follow us and we will take you on a journey that uh, will be almost as fun as an eighth grade field trip. We're at Spangler Spring. Spangler Spring was the site of vicious fighting that occurred on the second and third day of the battle. It was really hot, so soldiers from both the Union and Confederate forces would try to sneak across to fill up their canteens. On the third day of the battle, the Union forces were able to recapture and secure Spangler Spring. Now, if we go down here, you can see some water from the spring. Did you get anything to drink here, Mr. Graham? <clears throat> I'm gonna pass, I think. Nah, but you can see the uh, spring, which runs underground, comes out here and flows down. Goes down its merry way. I assume it flows down into Plum Run, yeah, which yeah. is down there. Say it was a little dry in the middle of July. All right, guys, from here, we're gonna head up to Culp's Hill. Hey guys, we are here at Culp's Hill in Gettysburg National Military Park, and this is the extreme right flank of the Union Army's defenses during the Battle of Gettysburg. This is one of the few sites on the battlefield where there was fighting all three days of the battle. But this site was particularly important because the Confederate Army was able to take control of this, this high ground right here. They could easily force the Union Army off of the uh, ground that they had fortified earlier in the battle on Long Cemetery Ridge and force the Union Army to retreat to another location. As far as this cannon goes, I'm going to let Mr. Blake explain a little bit about the cannon and then we're going to take a bird's eye view of the right side of the Union flank of the Army. Okay, there are several different types of cannons here that, in, in Gettysburg from um, both the Confederates and, and the Union forces. Some you'll see if you look inside, they have rifling, which means it helps to kind of spin the shell. The other ones are going to be smooth bore, and they're obviously a little more inaccurate. The ones with rifling are a lot more accurate. You also might notice this one is kind of an odd color of blue. That's not the color it was when it was produced and during the war. They were polished, so they're brass. So you would actually see the glint off the cannons in the sun uh, as like artillery forces were marching or, or moving about. It was one of the ways to spot them. This is oxidization from rain and you know 150 years of time since then. They're also fairly heavy, so when they would fire, if you happen to be standing behind any of these wheels and it moved, well, let's just say that foot would get crushed. Behind one of these things is definitely not where you want to be when it's going off. Or in front. Or in front, yeah. All right, well, let's go uh, walk up a tower and get a bird's eye view of, uh, from Culp's Hill. Yay heights. Oh, well, that's a short. So, so that got stopped. <laughs> This is the tower in Culp's Hill. Because of the uh, times that we're living in, it is now locked and we cannot go to the top of it. But if you were able to go to the top, you would be able to see as far and as- the Cemetery uh, Ridge. Cemetery. If you guys might remember the Union, when you, when you see the pictures of it, the Union forces were arranging a fish hook. So you'd be able to see all the interior lines. That's why this hill was really important. He was explaining earlier, if the Confederates were able to hold this ground, you could shell and the Union force would have no, no other decision than to move and disengage. All right, well, off we go. Hey, that was brief. I'd like to go on the battlefield next. I don't know, kind of undecided. Uh, Mr. Graham, you could say that we're kind of... I'm stumped. So this was an unplanned stop, but we are in Evergreen Cemetery, which is adjacent to the National Cemetery here at Gettysburg, but we're gonna show you two graves in, in particular. This first gravestone marks the resting place of Jenny Wade, or Mary Virginia Wade. She was the only civilian that was killed in the Battle of Gettysburg. A young girl, I think she was, what, 19 years old? 20 years old when she was killed? And so this is the grave of Jenny Wade, the only civilian killed at the Battle of Gettysburg. If you follow us down the hill, we're gonna show you one more grave, the oldest person to participate in the Battle of Gettysburg. So we're at the gravestone of John Burns here in Evergreen Cemetery in Gettysburg. John Burns was the oldest man to participate in the battle. 
He was a resident of the town of Gettysburg and a veteran of the War of 1812. And I guess he just really didn't want an invading army marching through his town, picked up his old musket from the War of 1812, went off the battle. Uh, they tried to tell him to go to the back of the lines, but he uh, wasn't going to be told what to do. And he uh, ended up participating in the battle, and here he rests in Evergreen Cemetery in Gettysburg. There's a monument to him later on on the battlefield, and we'll take you there briefly. Hey, I want to welcome everybody to another non-official stop on the Gettysburg tour. This is the Jenny Wade house. And we're going to wait for the big old truck to go by before I talk a little bit more. Okay. Hey, welcome to another non-official stop on the Gettysburg tour. This is the Jenny Wade house. Jenny Wade, as I mentioned, is the only civilian to be killed. <laughs> the loudest <laughs> possible Take truck. Three. Yeah. Hey, welcome to the Jenny Wade house, another non-official stop on our tour of Gettysburg. Jenny Wade is the only civilian to be killed at the Battle of Gettysburg. She was making bread for Union soldiers when a stray bullet came through the kitchen door and struck her in the back and killed her. Mr. Raymond, you know, I've always been curious, why was she, why was she making bread? Well, she was making bread because she needed the dough. All oh, right, seriously, great. moving on. We have some other things we want to look at here uh, on the building itself. So all throughout Gettysburg, you'll see these plaques that say this is a Civil War building. So these are, are kept. To do any changes to these buildings, you have to go through a huge process. Uh, I have a friend of mine who works here in town that does renovations of these, and you have to go through the Historical Society to do anything different. They don't want you to alter it. They still want a lot of these buildings looking at least very similar to what they did uh, in that time in July of 1863. But a lot of these original buildings also have scars of the actual battle, too. If you follow around, you can see holes that are left in the brick from the bullets that were flying in July of 1863. And in particular, and I know this because I toured this house twice, this particular bullet hole is the bullet that killed Jenny Wade. That hole went through that door, through a second door, and then it ended up in Jenny Wade's back as she was making bread. All right, there's no pick me up after that. Let's move along. <laughs> hey guys, and we're here standing at the Peace Light Eternal Memorial here at Gettysburg National Military Park. And if we were here on a field trip, this would have been one of the first places we'd have brought you because from this vantage point, it, you can really see the Appalachian Mountains. It's those mountain chains that the Confederate Army used to hide their movements into the north. And so you do have a good vantage point of the layout of the topography of the battlefield on the first day. But let's talk about this memorial itself. It was dedicated in 1938 by President Franklin Roosevelt for the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. And the bottom of it is very symbolic. I mean, the construction of it is very symbolic. The bottom is granite from the state of Maine, and the top of it is limestone from Alabama, representing uh, unification between North and South. It does have a natural gas flame that is constantly burning at the top, and it is that flame that was the inspiration President Kennedy's tomb in Arlington National Cemetery. The Kennedys visited Gettysburg during President Kennedy's term in office and Jacqueline Kennedy was taken back by the idea of an eternal flame and so that is where the inspiration for the eternal flame on President Kennedy's tomb came from. So we'll take a walk around the memorial and we'll get Mr. Graham explain some of the breech loading cannons that are over here. Hey guys here. Just off the uh, Peace Light Memorial, we have some really interesting cannons here. Let me give you a quick anatomy of a cannon. This is the muzzle in the front, and that's the breech in the back. Most cans during this time, during use, during, during, use, let me try again. Most cans used during this time were loaded from the muzzle. You'd swab the barrel with some water, you put a charge in, the projectile in, light it off from the back, and you repeat over and over again. Let me take you to the back of this one. This one's just a little bit different. This is called a breech loading cannon, which means it loads from the breech. There are some really key advantages to loading a cannon from the breech. It's a lot faster, it's a little bit safer, and it's, it's honestly just a little bit easier to do so. If this weren't welded shut, you'd unscrew this, this would swing out, an old shell would come out of the back, and a new shell would go in. But one of the problems at this time is mass producing this ammunition was very difficult just during this time period. Right down the road from the Peace Light Memorial, you'll find a monument to the 11th Pennsylvania Infantry, which looks like the ordinary average monument. But if you follow me around, 
This is no average monument. This is one of two monuments on the battlefield that has a dog on it. And this is a monument also, not just to the 11th Pennsylvania, but also to Sally the dog. Sally was the infantry's mascot. And during the Battle of Gettysburg, there was fighting here with the 11th Pennsylvania infantry and they were forced to retreat and there, no, Sally was nowhere to be found. Fearing that she had died, they came back the next day, but there Sally was still here protecting the fallen comrades from the 11th Pennsylvania infantry. Sally's gonna have puppies and those puppies are gonna be given to members of the 11th Pennsylvania infantry. But unfortunately for Sally, like most of my stories, they don't end well and Sally's going to die the following year in 1864 in the Battle of Virginia. Alrighty, on the first day of the battle, this is when we had a small Union force commanded by a man named Buford uh, that was a cavalry force. They were up just in the edge of town by the seminary, and in doing so, they were able to see a large infantry unit coming down from Chambersburg. That's where a lot of the Confederates were. They were on the other side of the mountains. As they were coming through, he knew that his force was small, but they had superior weapons. So rather than being the typical where you have to load from the front, much like cannons, they were sharps that you could load from the, the side. They were breech loaders, so they could fire much, much quicker. He, however, knew that he could not stop that big of a force with his smaller force. Just they did not have enough men. They were relying upon another major force commanded by this man, John Reynolds. John Reynolds was from Lancaster and the Major General. Um, Mr. Raymond is gonna explain what exactly something means up here, but Reynolds, unfortunately, once they got involved, they were able to stop the Confederates that day, but Reynolds was killed. Some say by a stray bullet or from an infantryman. Some say that there was a sniper that shot him in the head. He, he was killed here on this spot. And Mr. Raymond is gonna explain some of the symbolism of when you're going around the battlefield and see you know, monuments with horses, what it actually means. As Mr. Blake just uh, explained, General Reynolds was killed here at Gettysburg and even somebody that didn't know much about history might be able to determine it by looking at the horse. Mr. Reynolds is riding on a horse that's got two feet that are elevated. Whenever a horse has got two feet that are elevated, it means that that person was killed in battle here. If they got one foot elevated, it means that they were wounded in battle. And if the fleet has got all four hoofs on the ground, it means that they survived the battle. So again, all four on the ground, they survived. One foot elevated, they were wounded in battle. Two feet elevated, they were killed in battle. If, Mr. Raymond, do you know what you're looking at if you see a horse with no legs on the ground? No, <laughs> no I don't. A carousel. <sighs> oh, brother. All right, so it's important to remember that the Battle of Gettysburg took place in a town that was basically a farm town. And we talk about the sheer volume of casualties, the human toll of the Battle of Gettysburg, over 50,000 casualties. But you gotta remember, because it was a farm town, there were thousands of dogs, cats, chickens, pigs, cows even, that would have been killed in the crossfire. It would have been a horrific scene. Even today, Gettysburg is still a farm town. Just in the field behind us here on the battlefield, you see some cows that are laying down in the field. Yeah, if you'd move over here, you could see some ground beef. Well, as we promised at the cemetery, this is the statue of John Burns, the oldest man to participate in the Battle of Gettysburg. If you want to find his statue, it's located just down the road from the Reynolds statue. John Burns was a resident of the town of Gettysburg. This is his monument. He's the oldest man to participate in the battle. A little bit off the beaten path here to Gettysburg National Military Park, you will find a statue of the Major General Abner Doubleday, who commanded New York troops here at the Battle of Gettysburg. Not only was Abner Doubleday at the largest battle of the Civil War, but he was also at the first battle of the Civil War at Fort Sumter. Now, Abner Doubleday is most famous, though, not for his heroics on the battlefield, but for his, well, pseudo contributions to American sports history. And to tell you this, I'm gonna take the camera and let Northeastern graduate and former Northeastern High School baseball player, Alex Raymond, explain what he knows about Abner Doubleday. What's up guys, Mr. Raymond's son here. Um, I don't have specifics for you, but I did do some research on this. Apparently Abner Doubleday had nothing to do with baseball at all. This old guy, way back when, apparently told some people that he was friends with Abner and that one day he just came with a set of rules for this game of baseball. But in reality, Abner was even interviewed about it. He even said that he had nothing to do with baseball at all. Um, the actual rules for baseball were just progressed over time through different clubs and different teams. So 
It's a myth. So we've hiked out into a field in what is probably the most famous charge of the entire Civil War. This is known as Pickett's Charge. And you can see the monument to the Virginia Monument of Robert E. Lee right back there. And on the afternoon of July 3rd, 1863, the third day of the Battle of Gettysburg, 22,000 Confederate soldiers lined up in this tree line you can see sprawling behind me the whole way down there are going to march into this field, all trying to take the Union Army, which is basically on that high ground over there, a mile in the distance. After about 40 minutes, the Confederate Army is going to suffer over 6,000 casualties, and they're going to retreat back to the tree line. This famous charge becomes known as Pickett's Charge. So, Mr. Graham, I was wondering, are you the best science teacher around? Well, you know, I am outstanding in my field. This is another non-official stop here at the Battle of Gettysburg. It's one a lot of people don't know about. This is just a simple paved bridge over Plum Run, but it's got some really, really cool historical significance. So I'm gonna turn that over now to Mr. Graham. So our Earth is a pretty dynamic place. Uh, 200 to 250 million years ago, during the Jurassic period, Pennsylvania had a climate that was very similar to Florida. It was very hot, very humid, swampy, and wet. And during that time, dinosaurs roamed this part of the planet. This bridge we're sitting on here was made from stones that were mined not far from here in Adams County. And when they were cutting the stones, they came across a couple of dinosaur footprint fossils. And this is one here, you can see the three toes. This was of an animal that was probably about the size of a lion and stood up on two legs. So this is kind of interesting scientific history for uh, Gettysburg. So there were dinosaurs in the area? 250 million years ago, yes. Oh, did the Union ride the dinosaurs in the battle? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Graham, I don't understand. Why is that rock purple? I don't, I don't really know. Is it possible that that's the Barney fossil? So a big thing about being at a battlefield is you gotta understand the purpose of the signs and the symbols. For example, on this trail, you apparently are allowed to horse around. But this one, you're not. All right, so we're about to go to a place on the battlefield that not even a licensed battlefield guide will take you. This is completely self-guided. We're going to walk up to the top of Big Round Top. And Big Round Top is interesting. There was no battle that happened up there. There's no real fighting. However, there are remains and remnants of fortification walls that are up there. So it's worth the hike up to the top. I want to point out that some of the things here at Gettysburg, though, are modern. For example, there is no historical significance whatsoever to this bicycle rack. But Mr. Gimby will tell you otherwise. That we want to explain the historical significance yeah. of the porta pots. So, generally, Union forces um, are depicted as wearing blue uniforms. Confederate is wearing gray uniforms. Now, as as the war went on, that wasn't always the case. As money got tight. However, here there are two porta pots: the blue one for the Union soldiers and the gray one for the Confederate soldiers. And off we go. You guys hear all the talking, all the chatter here? There's a lot of dialogue. Keep moving. <laughs> well, we're almost to the top of Big Round Top. Even though it's one of the least visited places on the battlefield, because no fighting actually happened here you do see some of the fortifications and walls that were built by Union soldiers. Actually, the 20th Maine was up here on the night of July the 2nd, prior to uh, the last day of the battle. So I just think that this is a really cool place to come to. So it's about a quarter mile hike to the top of Big Round Top, and it's just an out of the way part of the battlefield where you can come and just most of the, all the monuments are Union monuments. There are no Confederate monuments here. This ground was held by Union soldiers. Uh, the 20th Maine is one of the regiments. Uh, we actually, as steep as that hill was coming up, the other side over here is a significantly much more steep hill. It is pretty much a sheer drop off, but you do have a very nice view of Adams County from up here. All right, so we're now leaving Big Round Top and we're gonna make our trek down to two of the most visited spots on the battlefield. Devil's Den and then Little Round Top. Tally home.
Follow me, grasshoppers. So, this is a tree monument depicting the unity between the North and the South following the war. So, this tree represents the North, and this tree represents the South. They start at separate places, but then they come together in the middle. <laughs> so this burned tree actually marks uh, something very interesting that they do here at the Gettysburg National Military Park. In order to keep the terrain looking like it did in the 1860s, um, this is evidence of a controlled burn. You know, the, the Park Service comes in and they will do a control burn to burn down any low brush in order to keep the vegetation and the terrain looking like it did in the 1860s. If you just look around, you can see on the ground remnants of charred, burned wood. This is just evidence of that controlled burn. All right, here we go. <laughs> he was yoked. <laughs> <laughs> Popeye without even trying. No, look at that. I tore my bicep right here. That's going to be considered elective surgery and can't be done now, right? Well, it's never going to be done. They won't even do it. So how does that impact you lifting anything Nothing off your lap? Doesn't. You just have a jacked arm the whole time. <laughs> That's his preferred hand, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we have walked off the trail from Big Round Top and we are now stuck right in the middle of the, probably the two most famous spots here in the battlefield at Gettysburg. Over here to my right, you see Devil's Den and to my left, you see Little Round Top. And on the Devil's Den, those rocks over there, that piece of ground changed hands a number of times during the battle, but in the afternoon of July the 2nd, it was firmly in control of the Confederacy. The Union held the high ground on top of Little Round Top. And so the afternoon of July 2nd, you had ferocious fighting between Devil's Den and Little Round Top. And ultimately, at the end of the day, the Union held the high ground and eventually won the battle. All right, follow us as we take a walk through Devil's Den. All right, so we're standing at probably one of the most uh, interesting spots of Devil's Den. It's called the Sniper's Nest. And what makes it interesting is, is this is the scene of one of the most famous photographs of the Civil War. Here at Devil's Den, behind this wall construction, you have perfect shot on Little Round Top, which gives you an idea just of how good the technology is and just how much advancement was made in rifle technology. The interesting thing about the photo that was shot here was that it was staged. Now, not every Civil War photo was staged. It's far from that. But this one was and this is prior to the rules for photography usually the rules don't catch up with the technology till later on and so in the 1860s where as far as photography and warfare goes there are no rules and so Alexander Gardner a very famous Civil War photographer thought that this would be a perfect spot for photograph and this was a day or two after the battle but there wasn't a body there further down the hill they drug a Confederate soldier up, laid him against this wall, pulled a rifle out of the photography traveling studio and put it against the wall almost like a prop and then took the photograph. It is probably the most famous photograph of the Civil War, but albeit staged. Hey guys, scattered throughout the battlefield are witness trees. Those are trees that were here during the battle and the Park Service does their best to preserve them. If they fall over, sometimes they'll make something like a souvenir out of them. This tree behind me is one of those trees. Uh, we think it's an oak tree. And just like the tree here, we're gonna, we're gonna leaf. All right, gentlemen, we are about to take a walk up to Little Round Top to visit some of the memorials, talk about the 20th Maine, people like Joshua Chamberlain, Strong Vincent, Patty O'Rourke, and Governor Warren, who's chief engineer of the Army. And we could take the paved path, or we could take the non-paved path. We're, we're gonna go non-paved. We're gonna go non-paved. Non non yeah. Here we go. Gotta catch my breath here, we just hiked up the hill. Mr. Raymond mentioned the term high ground a couple times today, and really what he's referring to is higher ground. If you're trying to take higher ground, it's much harder. If you're obviously walking uphill, shooting uphill is much harder. If you're defending the high ground, it's much easier. You don't have to run downhill, or if you did want to run downhill, it'd be easier. And shooting downhill tends to be a little bit easier than shooting uphill. Hey 
Alright, so we're on top of the uh, New York Regiment Monument on top of a little round top and you can see that just the shape of it and up here that this is basically a castle and I think this is a great time to explain that not all monuments are created equal. The size of a monument on a battlefield does not represent in any way shape or form the importance of the regiment or the importance of the person. The monuments are placed here in the battlefield with the exception of one, which I'll point out later on, by the regiments or the states themselves. And so, just like headstones in a cemetery, the size of the monument doesn't show any type of importance. It just signifies the amount of money that the regiment, the family members of the regiment, or the town of the regiment, or the state that the regiment was from, chose to spend on that monument. This particular monument is a very popular one. It's a New York monument. And from up here, you can see the length of the entire battlefield. From Devil's Den, all the way up through the Confederate lines, towards the town of Gettysburg. Follow me over here, we take a look at Patty O'Rourke. All right, so this is the monument to Patty O'Rourke. Now, Patty O'Rourke graduated first in his West Point class, the very same class that George Armstrong Custer finished last in. Now, as far as Patty O'Rourke goes, the story is, he gets to Gettysburg on the second day, and he's told to go to where the heat of the battle is, and he comes to the crest of this hill, which is a little round top, just as Texas and Alabama troops are about to crest the hill. And it's Patty O'Rourke and his men that are going to repulse that Confederate attack. Unfortunately for Patty O'Rourke, he's going to be shot through the neck within 90 seconds of getting on the little round top and fall dead pretty much right where I'm standing. Uh, if you're here, you're supposed to rub his nose for luck, but I don't know what good that does you. He was dead 90 seconds after he got here. shiny. Yeah. yeah. All right, if you take a peek down there, you can see Devil's Den where we were, and we saw the sniper's uh, pit that was down there. There's a story that ties into that. As you can see, there's some cannons here. We talked about having the high ground. It's really important to put artillery here because it, it controls the battlefield. Even today, modern battlefield is still controlled by artillery. So there was a unit that was brought up here. There was a guy named Brigadier General Stephen Weed. He was the commander of that. We talked about the sharpshooters. That's a long shot, but even back then, they could make it. Weed was shot and one of his subordinate officers, uh, Lieutenant Hazlitt, came to basically comfort his, his commander who was wounded and dying, and Hazlitt got a bullet right in the brain, dropped on the spot. Just shows how dangerous those sharpshooters can be. Yeah, but what's really cool is the idea that we have all these monuments around. Some of the most interesting ones are the non-official monuments or ones that were left by soldiers after the fact when they came back to Gettysburg. If you follow me right around here behind this monument, you can see faintly engraved in this rock, Hazlitt's men came back and engraved his name where he fell. So one of the things that people love about Gettysburg that makes Gettysburg so unique are its really cool rock formations. And that's what makes like Devil's Den and Little Round Top so interesting to so many people. But there's one rock on this battlefield that people and visitors are forbidden to stand on, and it's Governor Warren's Rock. Governor Warren was chief of the Army Corps of Engineers, and as he, on Saturday, July the 2nd, 1863, he recognized that this spot, what has become known as Little Round Top, was perfect to place artillery in order to uh, fire at the Confederate Army in the trees. From this vantage point, you have a clear view from the town of Gettysburg all the way down into the northern part of the state of Maryland. As we talked about before, Little Round Top was a very advantageous position for an army that wanted to defend this area. As a result, there were a lot of attacks throughout the battle, and one of the most important defenders of Little Round Top was Strong Vincent. Strong Vincent was a 26-year-old from Pennsylvania that led a brigade of roughly 1,300 men. And on the second day of Gettysburg, July 2nd, he was able to repulse an attack from soldiers from Texas and Alabama. But unfortunately for Strong Vincent, he was wounded and died five days later. We cannot leave Gettysburg or leave Little Round Top without talking about this monument to the 20th Main. The 20th Main monument in this rock represents what would have been the extreme far left of the Union lines of the Battle of Gettysburg. We are already on the extreme far right when we were at Culp's Hill at the beginning of our field trip. The 20th Main was led by Joshua Chamberlain, who basically was a college professor. He taught rhetoric. And basically, it's like going into battle, being led by Mrs. Gerbich or Mrs. Melhorn, if you can think about it from that standpoint. But that right there is what Joshua Chamberlain did. Joshua Chamberlain arrived in Gettysburg 
on July 2nd, 1863, just in time for the battle here at Little Round Top. He woke up in Hanover that morning with his regiment. They marched the 20 miles to Gettysburg, and Jamin was suffering from yellow fever, dysentery. He basically had uncontrollable poops, flu-like symptoms, just was not feeling all that great when he was told by Strong Vincent to hold this ground at any cost. This is the far end of the line. The Confederates cannot get up around you or else they could roll over the Union Army from the back. All afternoon long, Alabama troops are gonna charge up this hill and all afternoon long, Joshua Chamberlain and his men from the 20th Maine are gonna repulse them back down the hill. Finally, on the last charge, the Union Army was low on ammunition and Joshua Chamberlain did something incredibly brave, ordered a bayonet charge down the hill, forced the Alabama troops back up towards Devil's Den and ultimately won the day here on Little Round Top for the Union Army. Hey, so we finished our walking excursion of Big Round Top, Devil's Den, and Little Round Top, and now we are gonna head over to the largest memorial on the battlefield, the Pennsylvania State Memorial. Follow me, grasshoppers. Hey, we're at the Pennsylvania State Memorial at the Gettysburg National Military Park. This is the largest monument on the battlefield. It's on Cemetery Ridge, directly opposite of where Pickett's Charge would have been coming towards us. The monument typically is open at the top, and from the top of it, you can get a bird's eye view of the battlefield. If you notice along the outskirts of the monument, you're gonna see prominent Pennsylvanians, with the exception of Abraham Lincoln. He's the only statue on that monument that is not from Pennsylvania. Around the monument, you will find uh, tablets that have got every Pennsylvanian that fought at the Battle of Gettysburg. It has their name, their rank, and their regiment. And so this is the Pennsylvania State Memorial, and it is the largest monument on the battlefield here in Gettysburg. If you are ever looking along the side for some family members, which I did last year with my son, we found some spots where there was a blank, and what it had been is when it was first reported, that soldier was part of that unit. Through additional research, they found that they weren't, and so they removed them. We would normally at this time go to the top, but unfortunately it's closed. If you do come here with your family, be aware the stairwell is very narrow, usually only one way up and one way down. Hey, so here we are at the National Cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The cemetery was dedicated on November the 19th, 1863, and most famously, Abraham Lincoln gave his Gettysburg Address right about on this spot, right here, where we are now standing. The soldiers that are buried in this cemetery are all Union soldiers. This became was dedicated as a resting place for the Union soldiers that were killed at the Battle of Gettysburg. When you walk through this area, you walk through this area with respect. You're supposed to be as quiet as you possibly can to pay your respect to the fallen soldiers. And ironically, we are just a few short feet away from the grave of Jenny Wade. On the other side of the fence is the Evergreen Cemetery. So we're kind of almost finishing here, pretty much where we started. Hey, for our final stop here at the Battle of Gettysburg, we had decided to come to the Friend of Friend Memorial here, which held a special meaning to the four of us. But before we go today, we just wanted to say, you know, we took you on a partial tour. There is so much more that you didn't see. You didn't see Calvary Field. You didn't see the wheat field, uh, the, the, the angle, the high, the, the high watermark. Go climb the towers. There's so much more here at Gettysburg for you to see other than what we just told about you. So, you know, on a Saturday, Sunday afternoon, ask your parents to bring you. Even during this time period right now, you can obviously still be here and there's not that many people. First of all, I want to thank Mr. A for giving us the day to come out here and film this video. Uh, I want to thank my son Alex for donating his time to film this, but not only that, he's going to go home and edit this thing. And, but most of all, we want to dedicate this field trip, this virtual field trip, to Charles Lenhart. He was my mentor, but I'm so proud that we all can call him not just friend, but brother, and we wanted to dedicate this video to him. So Charlie, thank you, and this was all you're doing. <laughs>